Hello, my name is Ian Pearson. I've been a full-time futurologist since about 1991, so I've got just over 30 years in this business. And people ask me all the time, how do you go about predicting the future? Well, I spend about half of my time monitoring current trends and looking at current affairs and reading up on the latest science and R&D. And then I think through iteratively about how all of that technology might be used by various people in government, society, business, but also about how it would be used by nasty people, you know, the terrorists, uh, maybe some hostile governments, and also activists as well. Uh, most importantly, I think about the interactions between the different parts of the system and how they, those interactions will affect the beginnings of the next generation, of the next iteration. So uh, it's really just applying common sense and logical reasoning to an awful lot of reading. And that's, that's all I do. There's no magic there. It's just uh, our common sense and logical thinking. People ask about the singularity and we hear a lot about it. The singularity isn't really a, a an overnight event. What it, what it will be is a, a very rapid increase in technology development as we get more and more assistance from artificial intelligence. It's kind of like ET landing and giving us all of the instruction manuals for how to do fantastic technology straight out of their spaceship. But there's a problem there. You can't make all of those technologies overnight. You have to read through all of the things and decide what it is that you actually want to do. You've got to discuss the regulation and how you might make sure that we get the best of these things. And then you've got to agree funding and international consent and you've got to build the factories and you've got to develop all of these things. So although the invention curve uh, gives you a singularity, which is pretty much an overnight event, you go from very ordinary technology to fantastic technology in just a couple of years, the implementation slows that down enormously. So it doesn't really become a very quick event after all. The first uh, area I'd like to look at in terms of future combined evolution of humans and machines is what I call Homo cyberneticus. Uh, some people call it Homo roboticus. It's essentially the same thing. But we're already starting to see this. We're starting to see already uh, the development of active contact lenses, something I predicted way back in 1991, where you put contact lenses in your eyes and you can live in a virtual reality, augmented reality world. We're starting to see um, people making circuits that you can stick straight onto the skin surface that will do Fitbit style stuff, monitoring your health. And increasing miniaturization will allow us to go inside of the skin in between skin cells so that you can do that Fitbit type stuff even more accurately. So you get five layers, a wearable layer like a, a smartwatch and a membrane which goes straight on your skin surface, even um, electronic ink which you can print on there. And then inside the skin you can blast in tiny little nanocapsules which fit in between the skin and they will be in contact with your blood capillaries so they can monitor your blood chemistry and also be in contact with nerve endings so they can sample the signals going through your nerves when you touch something and recreate those exact same sensations when you're doing exactly the same sort of thing in a virtual reality environment. So you can record and replay sensations. So the body is becoming an IT platform. As we get more and more nanotechnology, it gives us smaller devices, those tiny little sensors uh, give us information that you can then feed into neuroscience. That neuroscience feeds into artificial intelligence and accelerates that. That improving machine intelligence accelerates us in every scientific development sphere because uh, we get more assistance. And then that helps us to make even more biotech and more IT, so we get more advances. And that goes round and round in circles. So you get this nano, bio, info and cogno convergence, which is accelerating us towards a very far future, which is a very advanced combination of man and machine. On the way there though, before we get to humans, which are hybrid and cyberspace, we're gonna do the same sorts of things with bacteria, which are much simpler. So you imagine applying biotechnology and nanotechnology and artificial intelligence and applying those into smart bacteria. You're gonna have hybrid self-reproducing bacteria which make circuits inside their own cells using advanced DNA. And they'll be able to fabricate circuits inside themselves which allow them to combine with other nearby bacteria. And you end up with something I call smart yogurt, where you've got a culture of the 
companies uh, in, a, in a, a food supply. So if you do the calculations, it turns out you can make a pot of yogurt in 2050, which would have the same combined intelligence as the whole of Europe. So we're talking about something really quite advanced there. And one of the questions that springs to mind is, will these, will, will these trans bacteria allow humans to do uh, transhuman stuff? Uh, they might be very advanced and might not want us to do it. In parallel with that, we're starting to develop machine consciousness. People are already starting to work on this and thinking how you might do it. Uh, I've been thinking about this on and off for the last 30 years too. And it seems to me that you can do an awful lot of development in this just by thinking about how consciousness might have evolved in nature. So you start off with very simple sensors in algae or something, uh, which can detect where the light's coming from. And then you get more advanced algae, which can move towards where the light is coming from and then you add some sensors and some actuator circuits in there and some uh, more sensors which detect the actual actions of that so you can sense the sensations and when you get to that point where you're sensing the sensations and you're sensing that you're responding then you're starting to get some very primitive awareness and you could think of that as machine consciousness uh, if you were to do the same thing using advanced AI. If you start going round and round in circles with that, so you have a feedback loop where you hear something and you're repeating that inside your head, you're getting a sensory echo of sensations that you're experiencing. And that memory of a sensation is then coupled with a memory of the processing that you're doing it. And we're starting to get intelligent responses to the environment, which you're starting to become aware of. And you have this primitive consciousness. And in a brain the size of a human brain, uh, you've got a lot of this going on at the same time. You have a great number of these circuits going round and round circles with these uh, ongoing stimulus and response and sensory encoding and an echo of that and playback. It's going round and round in circles. And that's programming your neural networks into a deep knowledge engine. And you can think about all of those sorts of things as a, as a method of doing machine consciousness. So we've got the mechanisms coming along to allow us to do Robotus Primus, the very first uh, machine life, which is genuinely conscious. This, of course, will go to Robotus Multitudinous in a very short time where we've got hundreds of different kinds of AI and robots all around us. We already do have to some degree, uh, but they're not smart. They're not uh, conscious in any real way today. In the future, they will be, of course, and we will be able to have Robotus Multitudinous with lots of these different skills, different levels, and they'll be working with us, allowing us to concentrate on being human while they provide the machine intelligence side of that. But we will work in harmony with them and live alongside. So bringing this together, we can see already the beginnings of a future timeline where we have Homo cyberneticus, where we connect our bodies to the machine world, and Homo optimus, where we link uh, that to uh, an optimized DNA structure. And then we get the homo hybridus, where you've got optimized DNA, optimized body, but you're also linked into the machine world. And meanwhile, AI is forming Robotus Primus and Robotus Multitudinous. And we've got the, you know, the sims from the computer games and the bacteria. They're also becoming smart. And these things are all converging in the same timeline. Time line, and we will end up converging with that and forming homo machinus or homo roboticus, if you want to call it that. Meanwhile, ordinary people who aren't wanting to get the upgrades, we could call those Homo sapiens laditis, where they're just staying as ordinary human beings and don't want to modify. And gradually we see people moving into this uh, Homo machinus area because they, they want to get the upgrade too. But we end up with a lot of different parallel species of humans. We've got Homo sapiens that I guess, Homo zombies even. Uh, we get uh, miniature ones, which we could call fairies, Homo machinus, uh, Homo rip multitudinous, and even a form of smart nature called Gaia sapiens as well. So there are lots of different ways it might go. What we have to hope it doesn't go towards is the Morlocks and Eloy from H.G. Wells's uh, time machine. So we've got a very interesting far future evolution of humans and machines. I hope you find that interesting.